Good afternoon. Uh, today we're going to discuss John Dewey uh, and education. Um, and we'd also like to bring in after um, and really with Dewey um, uh, additional discussion on the American prophets um, and on the role um, that religion has played in uh, the concept um, of democracy. Uh, and so I'll provide um, a few uh, remarks um, on Dewey, and uh, then I would love to have a discussion. I'd like to know, to begin with, how many of you read anything from Dewey before? One. I'm assuming that two. So I um, have more. I'm assuming that anyone in the ed school has read uh, John Dewey. <laughs> But he was, uh, he was an educational reformer, a philosopher, psychologist. He was one of the most celebrated intellectuals of his time during the late 19th century up through the early mid 20th century. He lived and worked into his 90s. He died in, 19, I think it was 1993. So he was born in 1859 on uh, the eve of the Civil War. He dies in 1952. The overriding theme of his work and his life uh, was his belief in democracy. That's, he said that himself. And so that he believed that, that proper education was crucial for a democracy to um, sustain itself. He was born in Burlington, Vermont on October 20th, 1859, four days after John Brown launched his attack on Harper's Ferry uh, in Westford, now West Virginia, Brown and his small interracial army uh, were hoping to take over the nation's largest federal arsenal uh, at Harper's Ferry to, and then distribute arms to blacks and um, allied whites uh, and spark a massive slave insurrection that would ultimately destroy slavery. The plan, as you all know, failed. Brown and all the five raiders were killed, the five that uh, were able to escape. Um, and uh, his raid, however, ultimately helped spark the Civil War because it led to uh, the split in the Democratic Party uh, in which uh, Southern Democrats were so outraged with the sympathy toward Brown that they created their own party. In any event, Dewey was a central figure associated with the idea of pragmatism. Pragmatism emerged after the Civil War. Before the Civil War, it was not that common. Um, in fact, during the 1850s, um, both in the North and in the South, people had very rigid views of uh, themselves and their nation, and they were almost diametrically opposed, and it was uh, based on uh, slavery. Uh, and for pragmatism, um, for Dewey, reflected the idea that the concept of moral certainty was something that you needed to be willing to sacrifice in exchange for order. And so instead of saying, you know, whether it's slavery or whether it's in education, this is, this is the right way, this is the wrong way. Pragmatism is being willing to, in a sense, compromise. He attended public school in Burlington, Vermont. He received his BA from the University of Vermont, taught at a private school, then received his PhD in philosophy and psychology from Johns Hopkins. Um, he taught at Michigan, Minnesota. Uh, in 1894, he became the head of the philosophy department at the University of Chicago where he initiated the Chicago Laboratory Schools, which has uh, then circulated to some other schools where uh, experiments in education for um, K through, uh, especially younger children. Uh, in 1904, he left Columbia University, um, left for Columbia University in philosophy while working at Teachers College on the side. Um, he was hugely influenced by William James, William James's writings. Um, that was James's writings. Were, uh, Dewey himself said that they were one of the greatest influences on his own understanding of education um, and uh, democracy. 
Dewey helped create or lead and lead the American Civil Liberties Union, the NAACP, the New York Teachers Union, and the American Association of University Professors, and the New School for Social Research. He stood apart from most fellow intellectuals in the late 19th and early 20th century who believed that liberalism meant a commitment to free markets. And in the 20th century, liberalism meant a commitment to individual liberties. That was what most intellectuals uh, in the, um, believed, that liberalism in the, um, in the 19th century meant a commitment to free markets. The 20th century liberalism meant a commitment to individual liberties. Dewey did not share these commitments. For most American intellectuals thought of freedom as personal autonomy independent from the will of others. Dewey considered this distinction between oneself and the group as false. For Dewey, the community is far more, whether it's a community in school or a community in church or its equivalent, a community in work, was far more important than the embrace of the individual. Dewey was far more radical than most American liberals because he rated solidarity, this whole concept of community or solidarity, higher than the idea of independence. For example, um, he voted for Norman Thomas, the socialist and pacifist and founder of the American Civil Liberties Union, against FDR three consecutive times. For Dewey, thought was the means through which people came to understand and connect with the world around them. And thought was the foundation of, of education and a, and a good life. And Dewey really championed the whole concept of a liberal arts education. That was a key the key to teaching people how to think creatively, to give them autonomy, agency, a voice, and to essentially ask the teacher, ask students, what do you think? What, how would you respond? Uh, and as an educator, Dewey emphasized the, the importance that education should be based on the principle of learning through doing whether that doing is in reading or in building things um, uh, or in uh, uh, failing on, a, uh, on a, an assignment and then redoing it. Uh, he founded the New School for Social Research with Charles Beard, who was a leading American historian, and Thorsten Veblen, also another leading uh, intellectual uh, and uh, teacher, scholar, uh, and the new school emphasized the free exchange of intellectual ideas in the arts and sciences. Dewey very much embraced this kind of free exchange of ideas. Um, and uh, you read for this week um, the first chapter <coughs> of education as a necessity of life. Um, and before I just kind of give you a, a, um, a, my assessment of it, um, Anyone want to share any reactions to uh, education as a necessity of life? No? <laughs> You're shy again today. So Dewey says that a living being is one that subjugates and controls for its own continued activity the energies that would otherwise use it up. Uh, and uh, so essentially he's saying that humans need to <coughs> learn how to become their own agents um, and, uh, and to learn how to control uh, their energies. Life is a self-renewing process. Um, so in one sense Dewey sees human beings, in, ideally, in a similar way 
that Doug, Frederick Douglass does. In fact, Frederick Douglass says it much more clearly um, than Dewey, but he, both Douglass and John Dewey believe that human beings should continually evolve, continually <coughs> transform themselves, being in a continual state of evolution or flux. In fact, one of my favorite lines of Frederick Douglass is, uh, I'll just say it, it's a long sentence. He says, poets, prophets, and reformers are all picture makers. And this ability is the secret of their power. They see what ought to be in the reflection of what is and endeavor to remove the contradiction. So the ideal human is one, a reformer, is one that's continually evolving to create a better self and a better society. Dewey doesn't say it in those terms, but that's essentially something, what he, a, 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 a crucial, I think, theme of his educational philosophy. That from children to adults, you're continually evolving, continually learning, uh, and uh, you share that and you spread that uh, in creating a, a better society. Dewey um, also wrote at a time in which um, Darwin, Darwinism, both social Darwinism and uh, Darwin's theory of, uh, of um, ant, ant plants and animals um, in which uh, evolution or progress occurs from the weak dying out. Dewey says not merely individuals but also species die out and the life process continues in increasingly complex forms. He's essentially paraphrasing Darwin. As some species die out, forms better adapted to utilize the obstacles against which they struggled in vain come into being. Continuity of life means continual readaptation of the environment to the needs of living organisms. Uh, and so he, again, he's seen in society essentially as um, a continual readaptation, a continual, in theory, evolution rather than evolution. Dewey also emphasizes physical as well as mental experience. With the renewal of physical existence, humans recreate or regenerate beliefs, ideals, hopes, happiness, misery, and practices. Dewey actually um, embraced athletics or physical education um, in the sense that he recognized that uh, the, the kind of evolution or progress one makes in one's body as an athlete or as an, whether it's in walking that, there's, there, that he connects that to uh, the mind um, and uh, to, uh, uh, to the mind and to the intelligence. The continuity of any experience through renewing of the social group is a literal fact. Education is the means of this social continuity of life. And Dewey also contrasts, he, Dewey argues that for education and for society to be democratic, there needs to be a coherence among the members of the groups, or the group. He contrasts the immaturity of the newborn members of a group who become the future sole representatives of the group and the maturity of the adult members who possess the knowledge and customs of the group. So education for the, the elders educating the young is crucial, foundational for society to um, evolve. The immature members need to be initiated into the interests, purposes, information, skill, and practices of the mature members. So essentially it's why he gives so much emphasis to education, to teaching. Because if you don't teach, whether in the home or in schools, uh, the group will cease its characteristic life. The community 
will unravel. And this sense of cohesive community is foundational uh, for Dewey. In fact, he, so Dewey also wrote at a time in the early 20th century where his um, characterization, especially of indigenous people, is, um, is uh, not, um, is, to I'll just say, totally inappropriate, but it was during a time in which a lot of intellectuals saw a dramatic distinction between what they called savages and um, civilized members. Dewey says, even in a savage tribe, however, the achievements of adults are far beyond what the immature members would be capable of if left to themselves. With the growth of civilization, and this was a period in which intellectuals distinguished between civilization and savagery, and there was a clear hierarchy there. With the growth of civilization, the gap between the original capacities of the immature and the standards and customs of the elders increases. So he wants a, a, community, a, a, a community in which everyone under, recognized the importance of the community. Um, with, the, let's see, mere physical growing up, mere mastery of the bare necessities of subsistence will not suffice to reproduce the life of the group. So it's crucial for Dewey that you, 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 you um, cultivate this uh, almost sacred understanding of the individual and their, his or her ability uh, to, um, to create and to create communities and to create things himself or herself. Uh, but there's also um, a, uh, they, um, uh, an ability, or he emphasizes the importance of reproducing the life of the group so that community remains intact. Deliberate effort and the taking of thoughtful pains are required. Beings who are born not only unaware of, but quite indifferent to the aims and habits of the social group have to be rendered cognizant of them and um, interested. Education and education alone, he says, fuses, it, it, it uh, resolves the huge gap between the young and the old, between men and women, between poor and rich. Education can break down these barriers to a community. And only education can. Um, society exists through a process of transmission in this way quite as much as biological life. The transmission occurs by means of communication of habits, of doing, of thinking, of feeling from the older to the younger. And without this communication, social life cannot survive. It's how the community is created. Yes. Hi. So um, I'm curious to get some of your thoughts. Um, I'm interested in this because that's why I want to write my paper about anyways. But I'm curious for your thoughts on this. But so obviously, like in today's world, yes. um, education tends to be one of the places that schools are the places where a lot of like political issues kind yes. of are used as a sport, as like a foreground for political parties. Yes. And I'm curious to know what your thoughts are about, I guess, like what you would think of things like bills that keep out certain types of curriculum or that um, would prohibit certain conversations from happening on, in schools and like if that seems would be classified by Dewey as undemocratic based on this book. You see, yeah, so in other words, for example, what would Dewey have thought about, C, about uh, banning CR, the idea of CRT? He would have hated it. He would have absolutely despised it. Um, he believed that the what? this critical race theory that you know so all these, these I mean first of all these Republicans who are banning critical race theory and say they have no clue what CRT even is you know it's a theory that was created as you know at, at Harvard Law School um, it, it begins in from a legal perspective. And you know, essentially, it's 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 a really about democracy. It's it's about democracy, and it, it's 
it's also about the importance of being accurate and faithful about the past in order to learn from it. And essentially, these, um, the congressmen who are banning CRT, essentially what they want to ban is the long history of American racism and American slavery, period. Uh, and it's, I mean, many of them recognize that, and uh, it's, but, so that's a long answer to your question. Dewey would have hated that. I mean, he, Dewey very much embraced um, the student to um, develop his or her own ideas, or their own ideas. He really encouraged that. I mean, he recognized the importance of, you know, literacy, both in terms of words and in images, but he, he, his, his vision of a classroom was not you know, lecturing to students and saying this is where those, he encouraged them to, to first find out what they're interested in, what they, what they become really interested in or passionate about, and then help them cultivate that. Um, to that point, that follows up to the second question, do you know if, like, where he stood in terms of like, whether it was like a what his views were with like things like uh, like Montessori. Um, like yeah, that's a great. So he was um, he actually he was he was he was a fan, a big fan of Montessori. Um, I mean, he didn't talk that much about Montessori because Montessori becomes popular when he's very he's quite old. <laughs> uh, but he he actually really liked um, that that vision of a Montessori school and recognized that it wasn't for everyone. Recognized that it wasn't for everyone. Um, but that, that, that notion that you allow the, the student, the child, or the, to um, be curious and to explore things that, and then to, um, and to essentially that becomes a form of self-learning in Montessori. He encouraged um, that um, Montessori school. In fact, in his writings, he um, deprecates the idea of just lectures. Which I'm giving that idea. of lectures. The the um, the monologue is not the proper form of address in the classroom. Which I'm giving. He really embraced discussion, but um, very much so. Which is why we've been trying to get you to to have discussions. But thank you for those questions. Others. Yes. How would do have felt about something like a technical or vocational school where you're developing a skill but perhaps don't have the sort of liberal arts background or sort of that's learning true. process that you might have? That's like a school great question. He loved he loved technical schools. He recognized that you know some people their intellectual abilities are in terms of making things, literally making things and doing tech, uh, technological work, building things. He actually was a huge proponent of uh, technical schools and encouraging people to have a choice. Um, he, he recognized that the classroom, that because of the huge range of, you know, of both of children, of humans, that you know, humans are, they have different interests and different passions or develop them. And he wanted um, the opportunity for children, for young children, to be able to be exposed and to find out what they are, uh, what their aptitudes are, what they're good at, and um, and what or what and then what they love. He was a huge fan of that. There was another question. Yeah. Uh, how do we put Dewey in conversation with somebody like Du Bois? Because I guess the talent you have, you know, obviously. That's a great know, question. How do we put? Du yeah. Yeah, that's a great question. How do we put Dewey um, in conversation with Du Bois? Uh, so, first of all, Du Bois. Uh, so Dewey. Dewey respected Du Bois. They were very different. Dewey was not. Dewey never called himself a radical or revolutionary. Dewey, you, I mean, where you could fault Dewey 
was his unwillingness or perhaps blindness about a race in the United States. Um, du, Bois, du Bois' writings, and especially his writings um, uh, about education uh, and about young people and uh, it are similar to Dewey's. Um, but their foci were very different. I mean, so you can fold. I think you can generalize the argument. I don't think it's just about race versus non-race. I think it's about paradigms and frameworks versus what goes on in them also. That yes, yes, Dewey's that's true. That's Dewey's true. pragmatism was a, I think, a, dom a domesticated pragmatism in the sense that the pragmatic principle of choice applied to one problem after another within the framework. Right. Whether it was a conceptual framework, a, an intellectual paradigm in science, or an institutional framework in politics. Right, right. So almost none of his writing is critique of the framework. Right. Uh, and that in and of itself, even without any further elucidation, is already a revelation of a kind of conservative reformism, a practical reformism. Yes, yes, yes. William James, yes. although he never developed this explicitly, was temperamentally more radical. Yes, I completely agree with and you. Boys was much closer to William James yes. than John Dewey in yes. this respect. Completely agree. Yeah. Completely agree. Yeah. So yeah. <clears throat> so for example, just so this doesn't seem impossibly obscure, take in a completely different area, the idea, Hume's idea of a contrast between revolutionary science and normal science. Revolutionary science is, is the transformation of the paradigm within which normal science works. Now, what a radicalized pragmatist might say is that our objective should be to break down this distinction so that normal science, little by little, acquires some of the characteristics of revolutionary science. So instead of having Aristotle, Newton, and Einstein, the genius, and everyone else is a drone working within the frameworks that they establish, the radical position is the drones rise up right. and they acquire some of these powers which are attributed just to the genius. And the same thing goes then by analogy in politics. That's what would distinguish a radicalized pragmatism from a non-radical or domesticated pragmatism. Right, right, right. And, and Du Bois, in a sense, um, Evolves. I mean, Du Bois becomes much more, uh, uh, much more, much more radical, 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 but not and in, not just because there's the concern with race, but right. because there's this methodological impulse yes, yes. to deal with the structure, with the framework, yes. and not just with what goes on inside of it. Right. Right. That's, that's great. Any other? So let me just give you some other examples of, um, uh, I mean, Dewey of Dewey's um, pedagogy. Uh, he contrasts artisanal labor, um, which, I mean, that still existed um, during industrialization, but mostly in, in a very, very minor way, um, mostly f farmers. Um, he, can, he contrasts artisanal labor um, with industrialization and, and how he teaches um, and how um, artisanal labors are taught with, um, uh, versus uh, how students are taught in, in, a, in a city, for example. He says a book or a letter may in institute a more intimate association between human separated thousands of miles from each other that exists between dwellers under the same roof. So he gives, um, in an industrial society, there's, there's no longer the, the 
physical interaction between people and trading and doing business together or learning together. And Dewey essentially argues in that statement um, that, that education and collaboration and even friendship um, can exist among humans who are physically separated by thousands of miles. Um, that they can share uh, like-minded uh, beliefs and morals and values just without being together. Um, and he says individuals do not compose a social group simply because they all work for a common end. The, in, in, a, in an industrial labor, an industrial, like the Ford factory, he says the parts of the machine work with a maximum of cooperativeness for a common result, but they do not form a community, by which he is essentially suggesting that assembly line workers do not form necessarily a community and he sees them more as a kind of cogs in the machine. Um, but then he, he complicates what he's just said by saying if the workers are all cognizant of the, common, of the common end and are all interested in it so that they regulated their specific activity in view of it, then they would form a community. So it depends, and actually, in, for in Henry Ford's um, assembly line, um, in the most recent um, big biography, uh, the workers did form friendships and relationships. Um, they each had a role to play, but there was this united effort to uh, be, uh, um, be uh, efficient um, and that, that the, the pay um, would go up. Um, Dewey also says uh, it would involve communication. Each would have to know what the other was about and would have to have some way of keeping the other informed as to his own purpose and progress. Conces con <coughs> consensus demands communication. And it's also, I think, um, significant that Dewey was a, also an advocate of organized sports. Um, including things like, you know, ballet, and, uh, I mean, is both a sport and an art, or organized arts and sports, in which people who are interested in a sport, art, um, come together, and that, that generates the same sort of, of um, intelligence and cognitive, it requires the same kind of cognitive work um, that, that education in the classroom uh, also requires. Um, and that it leads, it can lead to a common end of this community. And, and as I mentioned, um, part of Dewey's, for Dewey, without a sense of community broadly defined, there can be no education. So a family is a, a, a unit of a community. A school is a community, a unit of community. Um, a, a, uh, uh, a dancing group is a community, a, um, uh, a baseball team is a community, or can, it can be. Um, he says a large number of human relationships in any social group are still up upon the machine-like plane. Individuals use one another so as to get the desired results without reference to the emotional and intellectual disposition and consent of those used. Uh, so he's pointing out the potential downside of um, the industrial assembly line work. Such uses express physical superiority or superiority of position, skill, technical ability, and command of tools, mechanical or fiscal. So far as the relations of parent and child, teacher and pupil, employer and employee, governor and governed, remain upon this level, they form not true social groups, no matter how closely their respective activities touch one another. In other words, yeah, go ahead. 
That's a, <laughs> that's a great question. I'm thinking of Putnam, right? Like bowling alone. Yes. And the role of yes. social organization yes. and fomenting that sort of cohesion, solidarity, compromise, empathy, community building. And it's just pretty remarkable. And it's still a religious era yes. in the United States. Um, yes, it is still, you're, you're right, it's still, um, a religious era in the United States. Dewey does not, of course, one of the questions is what's the content of the religion? Yes. Well, that's what we want to discuss yeah, later. We're gonna, <laughs> we're gonna talk about. Dewey does not, um, he does not discuss religious views as part of this educational system. Which is, I think it's ironic. I think it's I ironic because um, there had been a long tradition that, um, that first, I mean, he's, he, em he embraces the importance of literacy even for you know, assembly line workers because that's the literacy, you know, literacy is the kind of lingua franca in which people form a group, whether it's public speaking or especially reading. Um, and yet he, he does not, um, and, and so I mentioned that because from the, from the throughout the 19th century um, into the early, into the 20s and 30s, mo based on literacy scholars, most Americans learn to read um, from the Bible. Which is why <clears throat> in the 19th century, the King James Bible was so foundational because it was, it, it was when it was designed, it was designed to be accessible for everyone. Um, and then the 20th century, multiple different Bibles became, um, were written to become more accessible. Um, but uh, that's why I think it's ironic that James never discusses it. It's not that it's it's not something he emphasizes in um, uh, the it's a, a religion or faith. Um, it's not something he uh, emphasizes, and that may be because of um, you know of uh, in the early 20th century um, ethnic prejudice was largely based on religion. You know, if you, it, <laughs> I mean, in, uh, until the eight, 19th, actually after World War II, I mean, John Butler, who's a religious scholar, is like, uh, said that if, if you're a Protestant and you want to marry a Catholic in the United States before World War II, your parents are going to try to prevent that. They're seen as totally antagonistic. And it's a, it's almost a um, it's almost a, um, a uh, apostasy of one's family. <coughs> and in fact, even in the early 20th century, even among Protestant groups, if you're method if you're a Methodist and you married an Episcopalian, a lot of parents would say that's not going to happen. So Dewey doesn't want to get into that hornet's nest. Yes, 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 yes. Although, I mean, Dewey would recognize the importance and the power of faith. Um, and, and also from an educational standpoint, just in terms of reading, um, that, I mean, virtually every literary scholar, myself included, recognizes that, among other things, the Bible is one of the greatest works of literature. Regardless of, you know, what edition you read, just the, the. So, as far as I remember, Dewey has no text 
in which he interprets the message of Christianity. That's right, that's right, that's right. Because that would be necessary to begin to answer exactly. the question. Yeah. Yeah. That's a great question. He emphasizes, um, as I said, he supports uh, sports, um, uh, especially with um, the rise of industrial labor where I mean, people are no longer working with their hands and bodies um, in the artisanal world. Um, he emphasizes the importance of training, both in the classroom and outside. Uh, he says that the pressure to accomplish a change in attitude and habits um, is too urgent to leave these consequences wholly out of account. Our chief business is to enable them to share in a common life, uh, we cannot help considering whether or no we are forming the powers with uh, which will secure this ability. And then he goes on to say, if humanity has made some headway in realizing that the ultimate value of every institution is its distinctively human effect, its effect upon conscious experience among groups of people, we may well believe that this lesson has been learned largely through the dealings with the young within the classroom. So the classroom is the kind of model um, for uh, this um, uh, community, um, it, it, which is why he places so much faith on uh, the community. Um, do you want to discuss? The uh, well, I think what I could do following on your uh, discourse there, John, is speak to some themes that take off where, where Dewey stops, that seem to me to be the problematic themes. And then it's a way of developing the discussion that you propose. Yeah, so, um, so Dewey is, Dewey was one of the most, um, one of the, best known um, and widely celebrated intellectuals of his day. Now, intellectuals in the United States have always constituted a small minority um, in the United States, especially in the 20th century, but with industrialization in the late 19th century. Um, being a millionaire and making a lot of money was seen as more prestigious than being an intellectual. And for, um, for <laughs> roughly from 1870s <coughs> to 80s to today, most Americans, based on a lot of evidence, uh, argue that, um, that very wealthy people are smarter than people who are not wealthy. That wealth is also a sign of intelligence which is, does not happen at all in Europe. <laughs> and most of the rest of the world. Um, and uh, so in developing um, Dewey's ideas, Dewey's is best known um, in educational circles today, unfortunately. Um, he's not read much outside of education. Um, he's seen but I think that the, uh, the ideas about education could be taken as an instance of a more general view. Yes. And yes. so I would say that the first great theme is implicit in doing and in this privileging of education is the idea of the future. Right, the right. School, in a democracy, the school is the voice of the future. Yes. And, and I think it's worth talking a little bit about that to see what's implied in that paradoxical idea. Because yes. uh, the, school, the school in all of these flawed democracies that exist in the world is besieged by three powerful forces which try to subordinate it to the present. Right. Right? So the first force is the family. Right. 
the family says, I want him to be like me right. Uh, right. in principle. Right. Right. Uh, then the second force is the state, right. the government. Right. Uh, and this is especially true in Europe. The government says, I want him to serve me, right. to be a good soldier, to be a good citizen, and so forth. Uh, and the third force is the university, which is the custodian of the intellectual orthodoxy, because the national curriculums that exist in the world are a kind of infantilization of the orthodoxies of the university system. Uh, the United States has never really had a national curriculum, no. so this problem isn't as manifest in the United States as it is in other countries. Right. So the paradox is, how can the these are the real forces that impinge on the school. Yeah. How can the school protect itself from them and, and ex exercise its, its task of speaking for the future, of being for the voice of the future? Uh, how can you jump out of your historical circumstance right. and represent something that doesn't yet exist? Right. That's the first fundamental problem. So and that yeah. problem, that problem, of course, has a feet of clay also has a tangible basis. It's not just a set of philosophical abstractions because, of, for example, the practical question of how is the school financed? Right, right. And in the United States, the answer to that question is it's largely financed on the basis of local finance. That's right. The local property tax That's right. is the basis of the public school schools. Yeah. The public. Yeah. So, Rich places have better schools, yes. poor places have bad schools, right. and of course that's an absurdity, which is against this right. idea. Right. The f in the federal system, there would have to be some mechanism of redistribution that's right. among poor places and rich places, right. not just of money, but of staff, to implement the principle that the education of a young person should never depend on the happenstance of where it is born, yeah. where he or she is born. That's right, that's right. But to carry that out, to make it practical, you have to have a mechanism of redistribution and also a procedure for corrective intervention yes. when the mechanism of redistribution is insufficient. Right. Huh? That's right. Now, Plato, at the beginning of Western philosophy, had a radical proposal of how to guarantee that the school would not represent the present. Right, right. And his proposal was to take all children away from their families. Uh, and and we, right, we think right. that, that proposal, you can see why he thought that, right? right. Because the family is, is watching over the, the <laughs> child and trying to ensure that the child will not depart yes. from its vocation of yes. representing the present and the manifest forces of society and health. But we think, or most people think, that that solution is not acceptable right. because it would deprive the child of the vital nourishment That's right. uh, of this. So it has to be more complicated. The idea has to be the child will receive this unconditional love. Right. We would want it to be told by the parents, now, because you have an unconditional place in my love, go out and raise a storm in the world. That's right, that's so the right. The question is, how will the school be created or formed so they can carry out this mission? That's right. So Dewey does, I mean, in his, um, his uh, school in Chicago, where, I mean, that's an experiment in trying to bring together um, students from very poor areas and as well as uh, wealthy areas, and it was funded. But it, he, I mean, he really does not devote a huge amount of time to that. But he recognized the, the role that um, family wealth played. Um, and but it's not just practical stuff, like the allusion to the university shows, right. right? So the university culture is based on a series of dogmas. Yes. One is a series of forced marriages between method and subject matter. Right. Right. That's one of the principles. Principles. So, economics is not the study of the economy; it's the study of a method right. developed by the marginalist economists at the end of the 19th century. Right. Uh, 
uh, the life sciences are studied by historical method, uh, but basic physics is studied by structural and the historical method. Uh, even though we discovered in the 1920s that the universe has a history, so everything in the universe is historical. So there are a set of dogmas resulting in these forced matters. Uh, there are also, the university culture conceals the metaphysical presupposition yes. of the way in which theories in natural science are married to empirical discovery. Right. Right. So for example, take something like relativity theory. The concept of a space-time continuum is not an empirical concept. That's right. It's a metaphysical idea. Right. Right. But it's through that metaphysical idea that the evidence that is adduced in favor of relativity theory is married to Einstein's theoretical system. That's right. So one of the things that a higher form of education would have to do is to disclose the metaphysical presupposition. Right, right, right. Not to induce the young, as the university system does, to mistake the dominant ideas for the way things are. Huh? So uh, this is just by way of saying, how could one go in Dewey's direction even more radically if the objective is a radical and not a domesticated pragmatism? And one is by forming the ambition yes. to make basic education more profound yes. and more radical yes. than university education. That's because right. the poor, the, the young, when they're young, are emasculated uh, and by things like the national curriculum right. and induced to confuse, mistake the way things, the dominant ideas for the way things are. Right. So equip them early on with the instruments with which to protect themselves against this intellectual servility. Right. So they will then be immunized when they reach the higher stages of education and will not be defenseless against the orthodoxies of the university culture. <laughs> that would be taking Dewey to the hills. Yes, yes, yes. yes. That's right. Yes. Um, so I'm accenting a, maybe a paradox or a like a conflict between, like, so from your, from John Gray, your progressive alternative book, in like, towards the end, you talk about um, the, the um, progressive education within like the school and like the idea that schools and, and specifically in relation to what you're saying about like taking students away from the family, like creating little scholars and just like this idea that like school should be a place where students can engage with um, knowledge in a way that will help them create yeah. and make baby thinkers and be on their own. How does that work with kind of the paternalistic influences of curriculum and like how do you I mean, there's still it's, a in, it's, in, it's incompatible with the national curriculum. That's what I'm yes, saying. Yes. The national curriculums are the instruments by which the university system tries to reach down into the education of the young because the teachers are formed in the universities. They're the messengers that carry the doctrine of the university to the schools. They have to be stopped. That's, right. that's what, that's what, that's yeah. right. What about equity? Like, how do you ensure, especially with things like schools having, I mean, in, a, in the system that we currently live in, where, where we currently have, where like schools are funded by local like property taxes and there are like gross inequities in funding and things like that. I mean, I think one argument in terms of curriculum is to have an equity of education in terms of like what students are receiving. Like, do you think that those things are also incompatible? Or like, is there an argument for equity in all of this in terms of like ensure that students are getting some base level of education? There's an argument for saying that the, that the right to a high quality education is a universal right of the citizen that shouldn't be dependent on this happenstance of where it's born. It's an anti-Republican idea. It's against the idea of a republic. Yeah. Huh? I mean, it started. And it's characteristic of a situation in which democracy coexists with a class system. The class system is incompatible with democracy. Yeah. So either, so I, one of the two must win. Either democracy must subordinate the class system to itself, or the class system prevails and subordinates democracy to it. That's, that's the background of these arguments about low and high energy democracy. And it manifests itself here 
in the way in which the school is financed. Yes. I mean, in the 19th century, beginning of the 19th century, Lincoln passes the Morrill Act during the war, which creates um, the public university system, mm -hmm. uh, which was free for everyone for many decades. And up until the, through the 1970s, um, some were virtually free and others were, it was still, um, it was affordable for virtually for most families. Um, and so that was one effort to, um, one, one example of trying to- To resolve the conversation resolve the, in favor of democracy. That's exactly right. And not in favor of the classes. That's right, right, that's right. So I think that's the first great theme. And on that theme, the enemy is now. That's the right. The present. That's exactly right. right. That's exactly right. Culture. Now the second great theme is, I think, epistemological. Uh, and there the enemy is, the enemy is the encyclopedia. So, the the, <laughs> the theme of yeah. the theme of education is how do you understand anything? How do we how do we understand? understand? How do we know? And the answer is you understand something by imagining its transformation. So that's how we understand what what is the imagination? The imagination has two moves. One move is removal from a phenomenon. This is the move that Kant emphasized. Uh, an image is the memory of a perception. To remember it, you can't be in front of it. But that, that's not the, base, the most important move of the imagination. The most important move of the imagination is the next step. You subsume the actual under a penumbra, a periphery of adjacent possible. The there's to which you can get from here. That as you imagine, into what can this phenomenon be transformed, given certain interventions or accidents that come from outside? And it's only to the extent that you can imagine how something is transformed that you have any ins insight into right, it. That's right. Otherwise, you don't understand it. It's just a, you stare at it. Right. Huh? Right. It's, a, it's a retrospective rationalization. Right which right. was a lot of the so-called sciences consistent. That's the right. social sciences. So, right, but not, the, not so much. The, the, not the natural sciences, the kind of right-wing Hegelianism, right, right. the real is rational, and so forth. So that, that, and that's what should be at the heart of education. Now the problem is these imaginative capacities of analysis and synthesis are not acquired in a vacuum of content. They require content. But what matters with respect to content is selective depth rather than encyclopedic superficiality. Therefore, education should be thematic or project-oriented. Huh? And so then you begin to develop a whole form of education which is focused on insight into transformation, natural or social. Yes, I mean, Dewey did believe that, he yes. advocated. So I'm, I'm, what I'm doing now is, is imagining a series of ways in which I could run in the direction of Dewey. Right, right, right. right, right going right, further right. than maybe he actually did. That's right, that's right, right that's right. So <laughs> it's not an anti Deweyan discourse. That's right, it's a, it's a it's an ultra Deweyan it's, discourse. It's a, it's a radical Dewey, because Dewey had never yeah. called himself because a radical. He it's himself a radical is not radical. Yes. He was the example of the domesticated that's pragmatism. Right. That's right. That's right. The radicalized yes. pragmatism. And then the third theme is the theme of cooperation. Right. Huh? Right. And what's the enemy of cooperation? The enemy of cooperation is the juxtaposition of authoritarianism and individualism. Right. Huh? Uh, and now the evolutionary and cognitive psychologists have studied how the development of insight from the child is intimately related to the development of cooperation. So now it's not just a philosophical assumption. We have some empirical base for associating cooperation with the development of insight. Huh? And education should be organized around that, which these these activities by which we explore transformative opportunity 
in the domain of the adjacent possible should be cooperative activity. Right. Everything should be teamwork right. among students, between students and teachers, among teachers, among schools, right. schools in present and remote. Right. And so that's the atmosphere. So it's the method of advanced science enlisted in the very early stages of education. That's also radicalization of Dewey's program. That's, right. That's, That's right. the direction in which we should go. That's right. That's right. And little by little, by the accumulation of these methods, we, we develop a way of resisting the present, right? This lever, right. it's the Archimedean lever. How can the future speak now? The future has no armies, it has no representatives in the world, right? Uh, I remember that Robert Musil said, the philosophers are despots without armies. <laughs> and we need, we need armies to, to take on the present. Yes. Huh? Yes. So someone asked about technical education, vocational education, that's another question. So, the objection was that in Europe, traditionally, right. technical education was for the masses. They right. became workers. That's right. And general education was for the elites. Right. But the technical the most influential model of technical education was the old German model right. of vocational training. That's right. In job-specific and machine-specific skills. So you learn one of the canonical traditional trades. That's right like being a plumber or <coughs> being an electrician. That's right. And you learn to work with a fixed repertory of types of machines, like the five types of metal cutting lathe. Right. That was vocational training. But now you can imagine a type of vocational training in which the focus is on the higher order, flexible, practical, and conceptual capabilities demanded for the operation of the numerically controlled machine tools of a knowledge economy. That's right, that's exactly so right. For additive manufacturing, for a 3D printer, for example, which has to be constantly reprogrammed as you use it, it's a completely different story, right? right? right. In which you need to have this high order capability. Yes. So you're breaking down the distinction between the manual and the conceptual, that's right. between the elite and the mass, but you're doing it in a way which goes up that's right. rather than goes down. Yeah, that's exactly right. I mean, the, the internet, the rise of the internet collapses, can collapse, or has collapsed in theory, the relationship between, um, between uh, uh, traditional forms of Manual labor and um, and, uh, and and, and conceptual manipulation. And conceptual. They're the same thing. Yeah. They're not. They're not opposed. Right. Right. Yes. understand technology. There's two ways of understanding technology that are both pertinent to this question. So one way is technology is the materialization of a channel between our experiments in the mobilization of natural forces in our favor, like for example the electrical force, uh, and our experiments in cooperation in the reorganization of our cooperative regimes. That, so
So the, the nature of a technology, like the, the rigid machines of the mass production era, is a particular way of relating the mobilization of natural forces to our experiments in cooperation. And, and the way that prevailed was a way that resulted in this command and control style of organization. Uh, it, it might not have been that way if other interests had been paramount. Now, there's a second way of understanding technology, which is technology has to do with the movable frontier between what we have learned how to repeat and what we have not yet learned how to repeat. So what is a machine? Everything that we have learned how to repeat, we can express in an algorithm or a formula. And we then embody the algorithm or formula in a mechanical device. The point of the mechanical device is to do for us what we have learned how to repeat so that we can reserve our supreme resource, our time, for the not yet repeatable. And then in principle, the partnership of the algorithmic machine with the human being with imagination is much more powerful than the machine or the human being alone. The machine will always replace labor. Every technology replaces labor. The question is whether in addition to replacing labor, it also enhances or empowers labor which it can only do cooperatively, right. in some cooperative form. So that's the way in which we would get to that. So I think it's, it is intimately connected with the, with the problem of cooperation. And one of the practical consequences of this way of thinking is that one would say, no human being should be condemned to do the work that can be done by machines. Right. If it can be done by a machine, it right. shouldn't be done by a human being. It can be done by a human being in collaboration with a machine. Yes. Yes. Because in Henry Ford's assembly line or Adam Smith's pin factory, the worker worked as if he were one of his machines yes. through formulaic actions that mimic the repetitious movements of the machine. And what we should want is the opposite. So that's a different idea of cooperation which is technologically enabled. Right. But I guess my question is, though, like, does that, I guess I, I wonder about whether that leads to, maybe not necessarily, but whether it is leading now toward, um, rather than cooperation, isolation, because the individuals are so empowered, right, by this relationship that yeah. they have with the technology that, you know, what? Of course, of course, that's a perversion, right? But that's yeah. one of the possible outcomes I would say a perverse outcome. Uh, but what that illustrates, this multiplicity of possible outcomes, is that technology has no intrinsic logic of evolution. It has the logic of evolution that we give it. It's, it's not as if it, develop, it, it, it develops automatically. Huh? So the, the background of ideas and impulses that we bring to it is decisive. If we started with the objectives that I just described, of saying we wanted to do the repeatable so that we'll do the not repeatable with it, then we would shape its evolution in that direction, rather than allowing its evolution to be shaped by the powers of the asset holding class or by the state allied with the asset holding class and so forth. Right. And then I mean, in today, in, the, um, in digital technology, I can give two examples of the collaboration um, between designers and um, technical um, and technical experts. And that is um, w what's become popular is um, digital um, visual art, and, and a number of artists have become internationally famous through their digital work. And they rely heavily on um, people who are brilliant at being able to implement the, technologically on the computer what, they're, what they hope to do, or, and both in revising it um, as, uh, and, and creating it. And they see themselves as a partnership. Um, and in many instances, they're, they're a small company and they're paid. 
um, that they recognize that it functions both ways. The other is even before, yeah, in, in a sense, even before um, digital, um, in movies, you know, in even without a digital movie, I've been on, I've been advised a few um, uh, producers and um, and uh, uh, movie makers, and they have a team of these experts who are able to transform each frame or each image in ways that are astonishing, and the, and they and the the uh, you know the directors will openly recognize that they, without this, this, um, this team of, of understanding how to um, refine an image, they'd be useless. Um, and so, and they're, they're paid very well. Um, so those are, that's an example of a teamwork within that kind of system, if that makes sense. Shall we talk a little about religion? Yes. Because we were provoked, right? And this, yes. is, this yes. is our other theme of consciousness and the, uh, and the transformation of consciousness. Right. So much of our argument has been about institutions and institutional change, but change of institutions is also always related to change of beliefs, right. of consciousness. Right. Huh? And we, we go back to the, uh, the, Amer the message of the American, American prophets. American prophets, right. <laughs> and, and combine this with religion. Yes. Yeah, it's about religion, right? Yes. Uh, and so uh, I want to say a few theses about this. OK. Huh? OK. So one thesis is that the evolution of the United States, of the American, of American politics, American culture, uh, has been disproportionately shaped by a set of beliefs associated with what I would call the middle period of Protestantism. Yes. Uh, yes. Which is the period of Madison, of Schleiermacher, yes. of Harnack, of these 19th century, late 18th century theologians. Right. Huh? Quite different from the early Protestantism of Luther and Calvin. Right. And quite different from contemporary Protestantism and its theologians like Karl Barth, right? right? Uh, one of the ways in which it's different is that for most of its history, Protestantism has shared the general orientation of religions, which is that they seek to penetrate every department of life, right? right? A, a universal characteristic of religions is that they're not private. Uh, they're not privatized. They demand to penetrate everything, to influence our collective life, our, our intimate life, every feature of our experience and existence. The, what I'm calling the middle period of the history of Protestantism was an exception to this period because it created a countervailing impulse toward the privatization of religion. To say more generally, the privatization of the sublime. Right, right. Uh, um, which has had enormous importance in the constitutional religion in the United States. Yes, very much so. Um, but I mean, in the United States, in the United States and in, in Europe, with um, beginning with Luther, um, most Protestants felt profoundly empowered of having direct access. To the Bible, to Scripture, yes, um, and and that their understanding that they could interpret, they could engage, they could read, engage, and interpret Scripture for themselves. So you're right; it's a private, individual um, activity, but it's also hugely empowering. Yes, it's empowering, but the conception of the sacred is that the sacred is intimate. Yes. And in some of the, in what Bloom, Harold Bloom calls the American religion, right. the religions that the Americans invented, like Jehovah's Witness, right. Seventh-day Adventists, right. right. Latter-day Saints, right. this idea is taken further, it's taken to the hill. Yes. And yes. intimate, 
the individual participates directly in the internal life of God. That's right. That the individual not only knows God's wills, but will act on I mean, God speaks to them directly and that they can act on it. And that was true with um, a huge number of people in the 19th century and today. So one of the ways, so remember early on in the course, I stated this thesis, that the message of the American prophets uh -huh. was this message of the participation of the individual in the inner life of God. Right. Uh -huh. And that from the outset, this method had two stains on it, two blots. One was a disturbed <coughs> understanding of the relation between self-construction and solidarity. Right. So under this disturbance, the American belief has been the individual becomes strong he ascends, yes. and once strengthened through his own efforts at self-help, uh, he yes. then can be generous. Right? Yes, yes. So he's a little Napoleon who crowns himself, and after he crowns himself, he distributes his largesse. Right. Uh, right. Uh, and that's, and that, that, I want to say, that's a false view of the relation between self-mastering and solidarity. Solidarity is intrinsic to self-mastery. It's not an afterthought. It's not something that comes later and that depends on the strengthening of the individual. The second taint has been the taint of institutional idolatry. Right, right. That there is uh, a formula right. of a free society which God wanted for the United States right. under divine inspiration founders of the Constitution established the plan of their free republic. Right. And the rest of humanity must either subscribe to their formula or continue to languish in poverty and despotism. Right. Because right. this formula needs only to be adjusted from time to time right. under the provocation of some great crisis, right. like the Civil War. Right. Right. Uh, so, I want to, so I, with this as a background, I want to go on. And, and okay, and okay. By this way. Okay. So, the United States has, despite the, the principle of the non establishment of religion, right. it has been largely a Christian society. Yes. Huh? Much more, yeah. And very it's influenced, large. determined, shaped by the influence of Christianity. Now, given our interest in understanding the message of the American prophets and in correcting it, right. uh, we have to ask, <clears throat> what is the message of Christianity? Or how do the Americans understand the message of Christianity? Uh, and, but what is its true message? And now I want to say that there are two themes, that this is a theme of, of an enormous because the history of Christianity is in large part a history of heresy. It's very hard to define what the Christian orthodoxy is. What is the orthodox message? And I would say the orthodox message puts at the center two great themes. The first is the theme of the centrality of love in the organization of moral experience. Christianity is the religion of love. And the second is the theme of transcendence. Every individual and the whole human race transcend the concrete determinations of existence. Right. Everything in our experience points beyond itself. Uh, we're shaped by context, but there's always more in us than there are in the conceptual and social worlds that we build and inhabit. They are finite in relation to us, and we are infinite in relation to them. And I think the deepest issue in Christian theology is what's the relation between these two themes? The theme of the primacy of love and the theme of transcendence. Uh, and I think there were different ways of thinking about this relation. It is in love that we are able to view on one another as the radical originals that we are. Right. Uh, uh, 
seeking to become more human by becoming more godlike. Right. But at the same time, we're not yet these context transcending individuals. We must make ourselves into them. So God's work of redemption, of salvation, begins in history, even though it continues beyond history. Right? So now let's take each of these themes. So on the side of the account of our moral experience, what is the problem? The problem is that the conventional accounts of Christian ethics are induce us to confuse love with altruism, Christian charity. Huh? Or to say, what is the core of Christian ethics? It's the imitation of Christ, Christ's sacrifice. Right. He sacrificed his own life on the cross. Right. Uh, and so that's the model. Right. That's not the model like, on this interpretation. <laughs> the model is not altruism, the model is love. Love is not altruism. Altruism is a relation from a distance, from on top, yes. huh? in which you sacrifice, can be even the sacrifice of one's own life, but there's no inner jeopardy. Of the fundamental difference between love and altruism is that in love there's an imaginative threshold. You have to be able to imagine the other, right. and to imagine the otherness of the other. And in altruism, there is no such imaginative threshold. Right. You make a contribution from a distance, from on high. There's no inner vulnerability. So uh, the price of love is the heightening of vulnerability. Uh, altruism doesn't demand that price. It demands sacrifice, but not vulnerability, and so forth. So it's, it, it is love and not altruism, which is the moral core of Christianity on this view yes, of the United yes. States. Now, what about the other theme, the theme of transcendence of the infinite? So I now want to describe the countervailing heresies in the manner of patristic theology, giving them the names, the names of individuals. <laughs> <laughs> OK. So, so you could say, there are two opposing sets of heresies. There's what you could call the Hegelian heresy, uh -huh. which is that there is a form of social life, which is the definitive form right. of our existence in the world, right? right? And this is what a Christian would regard as Pelagianism, it's a heresy. Right. Right. Uh, there's some forms of social life are, are, are higher than others. Right more closer to God, right. but no form is sacred. The institutional regimes of the world are dust in the eyes of God. Right. There's no definitive form, right. 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 contrary to the Hegelian heresy. Right. On the other hand, there's what you could call the Sartrean heresy, right. or the Romantic heresy, uh -huh. which is that the structures, the regimes of thought and of life are like the hand of Midas that kills the spirit. So when are we really human and godlike? When we shape the whole of the structure, right? right? Temporarily in these interludes, right? So romantic love as opposed to the routines of married life, or the mob in the streets as opposed to the routines of bureaucratic organization. Uh, so. Uh, the romantic believes the structures will inevitably come back. It's inevitable. Right. They'll come back, they'll once again kill the spirit, right. but in these momentary interludes will be really us. Right. Uh, so the romantic thinks, for example, the romantic novel, uh, the objective is to win the hand of the beloved, but the marriage is never actually described in the romantic. Right. because the marriage is unimaginable. Huh? Uh, so romanticism is a form of despair about our power to change the relation between spirit and structure. I mean, there's a huge... And to create structures that are more hospitable. It can be despair, but romanticism can also be hope. 
No, we use hope relatively because at least we have this power yes. to change yes. the structure. Yes. But can we change cumulatively the relation between spirit and structure? So I would say, with respect to this theme of transcendence, uh -huh. that the orthodox Christian message is that we can create structures that are more hospitable to spirit than other structures, but we can never reach the definitive structure right. in human history. There's no salvation in human history, even though there's the possibility of progression. Uh, right. Right. Uh, so I say all of this because this is all strange, and I'm, what I'm doing is I'm contrasting this to our conventional understanding of the Christian message. Right, uh, right. And I'm saying that this is a way of accounting for why those two defects of the prophetic message are defects. They're defects because they depart from what I'm claiming to be the orthodox. Right, oh, so, uh, yes, I, I mean, I would then ask um, the examples that you gave, I mean, I think, are, are wonderful that, and I agree with what you said based on the examples, but there are other examples of, um, of Christian faith um, being put into the service um, of what, in a sense, Christian scripture advocates. Um, so, but, but I would say that this orthodoxy, as I've characterized uh -huh. it, with respect to love and with respect to transcendence, is not just for the private life. This in, is to inform all of our political projects. Yes, it's, right? that's very true. That's and very, but contrary so, to the idea of the middle period of the history of Protestantism, right. that religion is just for the inner life. No, it's not for the inner life. A collective life, right, right. But I think that the um, the collective life, uh, the the role of religion in the collective life has had some uh, partial successes. Uh, what do you mean? The abolition movement. Uh -huh. So. A, basically, a, almost 100% of self-described abolitionists, which are distinguished from anti-slavery advocates in the 19th century, they they say the living human being is the thing itself, it, the thing the itself, image of God. We cannot enslave him. Yes, exactly. That's right. And they believe that all humans were equal under God's eyes. They quoted that um, forever. Virtually every abolitionist, and and there were a tiny number. I mean, most. Uh, most uh, 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 opponents of slavery or anti-slavery, uh, meaning that they were, they, they, they disliked slavery, but they were not necessarily willing to do that much to end it. Um, Lincoln was a classic example in one of his speeches uh, with Stephen Douglas, he said, when, when do I envision the end of slavery? Not less than, um, not less than 100 years. Abolitionists recognized it was so brutal, slavery was such a horrible, evil and br uh, brutal that it needed to be ended right now. And virtually all abolitionists believe that, that God was imminent, that God could help to, to help um, uh, generate actions among the believers, among abolitionists that could destroy slavery very quickly. Um, and women's rights were actually another group in which virtually every women's rights advocate um, was uh, recognized this imminence in a sense of God or uh, the, the equivalent. Yeah. Um, and and so in, in, and so there's a there's a fusing of the sacred in a sense, a sacred and the secular in that one's faith is um, used and, genera and generates the ability to achieve, a, essentially, to try to achieve democracy, if that makes sense. 
Well, what you're saying is that there were contrary currents that, that ran against this privatization. That's exactly privatization. right. There's, there are contrary currents that... Because it's contrary to the nature of religion. Yeah, okay. yeah, that's right. Universally, every religion has sought to influence every department of experience. That's right. Religion has never accepted to be cabined within some little part of our existence. That's right. Which that's right. Which is why they're these are exceptional. These are unusual these are exceptional. anomalies. An, an, essentially anomalies. Um, and in fact, there's a terrific work by um, William McLaughlin, who's both a religious historian and a cultural historian, called Revivals, Awakenings, and Reforms, and describes how um, a, the, the, the faith can, at certain moments, and it's, it's not common, lead to um, this vision of a democratic society that can be, that can be achieved. Uh, in certain forms, and in fact, he uses an example of uh, abolitionism, and he uses an example of uh, women's rights. Um, he's mostly focusing on the 19th century, but he articulates this framework where there's a clear distinction between uh, a revival, awakening, and form, and connects the connects the religious framework to the political. Framework. So we're left with the question of education, right? Can the school be? Yes. Can the school be the place, the site of a of a profound transformation, which uh, yes. equips the individual yes. to resist yes. Yes. the intellectual yes. system yes. to which he will later be tempted to subject himself? Yes. So I mean, one question. <laughs> So, I mean, a place like Harvard, in the, its beginning, as you know, for the first roughly 100 years, Harvard was as much a religious institution as it was an institution of learning, of public learning. A narrow, dogmatic. Very narrow and dogmatic, where there was little, very little opportunity for, for students to articulate their own voice. There was literally a that recitation, meaning that you recite, you basically recite what the what this professor has told you. <laughs> Which was not very fun for a lot of people, a lot of students. But in general, you're you're right. That I mean, what you articulated is the has been the norm. But there have been examples that have, I think, a few that have defied that. And I think that one of the problems in the public conversation is that in these societies, like the American society, there is a taboo against the religious criticism of religion. Oh, I completely agree so with that. Completely for, agree. For with one that. religion to criticize another, to say this is a heresy of Christ's message. That's right. It's <laughs> unacceptable. Right? Yes. Yes. Huh? But it's absolutely necessary. Yes. Both, if you take democracy and politics seriously, yes, they deal with the ultimates. And if you take religion seriously, also, yes, how can you justify that? That's huh? right. But it's why. Um, I mean, it manifests itself in the very fact that that we've had only two Catholic presidents in our entire history. <laughs> and, it's, and it's revealed in that immensely entertaining comment of President Eisenhower. Yes, yes. President Eisenhower yes, said yes. in the news conference, our Constitution makes no sense unless it's based on a deeply held religious faith. And I don't care what it That's is. That's exactly right. That's <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But no, yeah, Kennedy was, I mean, he was despised by a lot of Protestants simply because he was, he was Catholic.
does anyone want to comment or question? Uh, these are weighty matters in which we've dealt very rapidly. <laughs> Oh, yes, yes, yes. That's a great question. That's, but it leads in a totally different direction, right? Uh, so there's this idea of the axial age, right? The idea of Karl Jaspers and Max Weber, that uh, in the period from the rise of prophetic Judaism, in the middle of the first millennium before Christ, to the prophetic activity of Mohammed in the middle of the second millennium after Christ, the first millennium after Christ, there was all the, all these world religions emerged, uh, and they they're very different, but there are certain commonalities, in them, right? Uh, and so they all they first they desanctified nature. And they taught that the divine was beyond nature. It was not in nature. Then second, they established a dialectic between transcendence and immanence. The divine is not in nature, but it must come back and inform nature somehow. It must engage with the material world. Uh, right. uh, and the incarnation of Christ in Christianity is the most saving example of that. Transcendence becomes imminent. Right. Then third, they rejected what was the dominant ethic of these civilizations, which was the ethic of martial valor, of vengeance, of self-assertion. It was like the ethic of little boys, not say, don't ditch me. That was the dominant ethic in the spiritual history of humanity before that. Uh, and they accomplished a radical transvaluation of values. They said, uh, now uh, you're taught to love the stranger, universal fellow feeling. Uh, this is the most remarkable moral revolution in the history of humanity. Not that humanity practiced it, but that it accepted this idea, which was against all practical experience and against what was surrounding them. Huh? Then third, all of these religions, and I'm including now Buddhism and Confucianism, religion without a god, uh, all of these religions taught that the divisions within humanity um, class, caste, race, gender, everything, were all superficial. Uh, uh, now, was it then the idea that, were, were they offering just a redescription of the world, or were they offering an invitation to transform the world? Uh, and finally, in all of them, there was, it was like a two-sided ticket. Uh, one ticket was a invitation to escape the world, uh, to escape the nightmare of history. The other was an invitation to transform the world, the other side of the ticket. And it's not clear to what extent it was one or the other. So this, this was this, this period. Huh? So what we're talking about, which is Christianity, was a subset of these religious revolutions. Huh? Uh, the subset of the Semitic monotheisms, uh, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, and Christianity among them specifically the religion of love, as well as being the religion of transcendence. And 
because it had this central influence in American history and in the West, we're trying to discuss what its real message was. Uh, and I'm presenting a view on the basis of which the message of the American prophets, as we characterize them, could be regarded as defective and heretical because it departed from the real Christian message in certain ways. Yes, <coughs> it, 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 that's right, that's right. It was the, the original Christian. So for example, if a religion, if a, a religion that presents itself as a Christian message, as a Christian religion says, the American Constitution is divinely inspired. That's a heresy. For Christian, that's anathema. That's an abomination. Uh, and yet, they have sometimes taught that doctrine. That's true. That's true. That's true. No, the American um, Protestantism is a heresy from its origins, um, from the origins of Christianity. And it, but it man it it it, um, it spread it especially in the United States. I mean, it, I mean, one of the things that I think I mentioned this earlier in the semester that virtually all um, religious historians agree on, uh, American religious historians, is that um, the separation of church and state. Um, greatly contributed to the rise of religion because all churches and, um, and denominations had to compete in a marketplace. And so they needed to change their liturgy to change the way in which they, um, uh, in which they held their services to attract new generations of people. Um, and uh, it was successful. It was successful. They had a very, uh, good, essentially, they were good salespeople. They recognized what the masses wanted and they changed their, their, their church and their doctrines and their, um, the format to, uh, to um, accommodate uh, the desires and the needs of the present. Whether it was in music, whether it was in prayer, whether it was in um, service in all kinds of ways. In which other, um, I mean, the, the number of, um, I mean, the Catholic Church has done the same thing recently. Uh, but that's been, that was a, that was, that's one thing that Americans, American religious historians will distinguish in the U.S. versus well, the Christian churches have had immense difficulty in making explicit their message for how society should be organized. Right, right. And I think that the recent history of the Catholic Church is illustrative of this yes, problem yes, in a very yes. interesting way. So at the end of the 19th century, the, the cycle of modern papal encyclicals begins with Leo the Thirteenth. Head on the bottom, and it's essentially a promise of rights, right? right. Like these constitutions that began to be prom a, a created in the world after Weimar, right. after right. the First World War, right. promising everything: right. health, education, <laughs> happiness, uh, employment. Uh, then. But there was no institutional machinery with which to keep these promises. That's what the early stage. Uh, then in between the wars, 1931, Harum Novano, Quadratesimo Pius XI, uh, there's, a, there's, a doctrine, there's a corporatist doctrine. It actually very closely resembled Mussolini's fascism, and it taught uh, capitalism, socialism is bad, capitalism is bad. We have to create these guild-like organizations that will unite employers and workers and suppress class conflict. They shouldn't be selfish. They shouldn't be fighting with each other. They should be united in these corporate organizations. 
that was the one moment in which the church, the Catholic Church, committed itself to a specific institutional design. Right. Right. Yeah. It was embarrassed by this episode. It was burned, right? And so then it be and it's embarrassing to be associated with Italian fascism, embarrassing to be associated with corporatism. And so at the end of the 20th century, in the encyclicals of John 23rd, from Pacem and Terry's onward, it reverted to the situation at the end of the 19th century, right, right, right. in which once again there's a promise of rights and there's no institutional program, because the attempt to have an institutional program turned out to be a fiasco. So I think this illustrates this paradox of these religions. They want, they need to have a message for the organization of society. And when they try, it's the wrong ones. Uh -huh. And so they're beaten back to this uh, false neutrality, uh, this agnosticism about institutions, which is not in the real nature of these religions. So that's the background of the confusion in which we're discussing these issues. Right, that's right. That's right. So it's not as if there were an easy way out, because when a way out was tried sometimes by a church of immense influence in the world, very highly organized with doctrinal discipline, it was a fiasco. Yeah, it was a huge fiasco. Uh, huge fiasco. Whereas the Protestant churches, I mean, essentially, because of their foundation. The fiasco is concealed there yes, yes. because there's, there's no, no one is in charge. Right, right. right. And there's no doctrinal corpus which That's is right. being guarded. That's huh? right. The main object, the main uh, responsibility of the Roman popes is the guardianship of the doctrinal corpus of orthodoxy. That's right. It's not to run the church. Right. It's, uh, it's to maintain it's, orthodoxy. It's to defend the faith. Yes. Huh? I thought that was wild. You traversed a great deal of terrain. <laughs> Any, yeah, any last thoughts? So, I mean, does someone want to connect Dewey with faith? <laughs> I, think, I think myself that the religious themes are all submerged and implicit in Dewey. I agree, I agree. I mean, do, do we- They're more out in William James. I mean, yes, yes, yes. And, and James was probably the major inspiration and influence on Dewey. Um, and both, uh, I mean, there's, among both Dewey and James, there's been debate among scholars on um, the degree to which each was. But the American attitude to religion is revealed in that anecdote about James, which I, I mentioned before. Yeah, yeah. A lady in Boston society asked William James, Mr. James, do you think I should take up religion? And James answered, I don't know, try it out and see if you like it. <laughs> that's right, that's it. That's right. Yeah. We'll let you go. <laughs> so come next week, um, prepare to have a vigorous discussion about how to uh, implement a high energy democracy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ideas that are writing about it. Yes, yeah. And, and that include, yeah, ideas that you write about your papers that relate to it. That's great.
too taut.